now you can go for it. Okay, I hope you can all hear me and see the first image. Uh, first, thank you, Angela and Naomi, for this invitation and, and for bringing us all together. And, and welcome, everyone. Thanks for carving out a Tuesday evening to talk about maps. This, this is an honor for me. I don't often get to talk about this part of my work as an early American historian. But it's also a little intimidating since many of you have collected old maps and studied the history of cartography far more than I have. And, and that's particularly true when it comes to discussing the mapping of the West, because much of my work has involved slavery and the early Southeast. Of course, for ages, I've owned a copy of Carl Wheat's wonderful five volume study called Mapping the Trans-Mississippi West. But frankly, I didn't use it much until I moved here to Colorado eight, eight years ago. And in contrast, the Rocky Mountain Map Society has been exploring this theme of the mapping of the Trans-Mississippi West for, for years on a regular basis. Uh, even in this current Zoom series, one of the society's founders, Wes Brown, talked about the important um, map of Colorado made by Hebert and Peck in the 1840s. And then many of us heard Derek Van Westrom speak recently about the newest uh, high-tech methods that are being devised for measuring the height of peaks here in the Rockies down to the nearest centimeter. It was quite amazing. Uh, so tonight, I want to take a huge leap backward from our high precision world and talk about a time when North America, and especially its vast interior, was almost a total mystery to Europeans. Of, of course, that was especially true of the English. So, so this 1625 map by Henry Briggs helps to get us back into the 17th century European mindset. Naturally, each generation and each society creates its own maps and its own distortions. This 20th century map from the National Park Service is the sort that I studied in sixth grade and maybe some of you did too. I was growing up in St. Louis and I suspect maps like this piqued my interest in colonial America. It shows competing bands of European colonizers groping to understand the unfamiliar elephant of North America. And the faint topography reminds us that the immense West is made up of many contrasting environments. But this map gives no indication of enslaved Africans arriving in the Southeast, the colonized region that I've studied the most nor does it suggest any Native American presence at all, even though diverse indigenous groups had inhabited the continent for thousands of years. In the West, these long-lived communities had impressive knowledge of specific ecosystems, and often through trade and travel, they also had a general understanding of the wider whole. But for tonight, I want to focus on the ignorant newcomers, the French explorers of the late 17th century who had virtually no knowledge of the Trans-Mississippi West. They did understand, however, that deciphering the region's rivers would be the most feasible way to get a grip, quite literally, on this unfamiliar region. Uh, most of us have flown over or driven past these major rivers uh, and a few of you may even have been lucky enough to explore several of them by boat, roughing it with a GPS system tucked in your backpack. But the three individuals I'll focus on here had no such devices. René LaSalle, Baron Lahontan, and Jean Couture uh, each groped a different portion of the gigantic American West in the late 17th century, and each has been belittled or even dismissed entirely over the years. As you'll see, I'm less skeptical and more forgiving than many of my predecessors and peers when it comes to the extensive claims and tangled maps that these early explorers generated. I believe that these three very different Frenchmen hoped to outstrip any Spanish or English competitors. 
they were determined to learn all that they could as fast as they could. And it's clear, quite predictably, that at every stage they benefited from the knowledge of respected Native American hosts and guides and companions. But they also re relied often too much on the vivid descriptions and dubious charts created by their 16th century European predecessors. So let me begin by reminding you about Veranzano and De Soto and two relevant misconceptions they left behind. In 1524, just after Europeans learned of the Straits of Magellan and the Isthmus of Panama, an Italian navigator named Giovanni Verrazzano uh, was employed by the French to search for some comparable and more accessible strait or isthmus in North America. Reaching the coast of what is now Carolina and having no satellite images to tell him differently, he peered over the Outer Banks into Albemarle Sound and reported that, quote, we could see the eastern sea from the ship. This is doubtless the one which goes to India, China, and Cathay. And his legacy, as many of you know, immediately became the huge and elusive Sea of Verrazzano that appeared frequently on 16th century European maps. On the left is the chart in the Apostolic Library in the Vatican that uh, was overseen by Verrazzano's brother who had been on the voyage. On the right is Sebastian Munster's famous map from 1740. In 16th century Europe, it became the most widely circulated map of the New World. And it incorporated a version of the Sea of Veranzano, where my red asterisks are floating. That imagined sea morphed into the Sea of the West that Don McGurk has written about, and it gradually receded from European maps over time only to be replaced by rumors of some distant Northwest Passage, the so-called Straits of Anian, linking the Atlantic and the Pacific. But this desire to find some viable access to the Pacific would remain a driving force for the three Frenchmen in our sites. A smaller and even more relevant misconception was planted by the explorer Hernando de Soto who blundered across the Southeast from Florida to the Mississippi around 1540. Just as Coronado was leading a similar entrada across the Western Plains from Mexico. De Soto died in the endeavor, but the Spanish charts that followed were laced with misconceptions. This famous one was drawn by the Spanish royal chart maker, Geronimo de Chavez, and Abraham Ortelius published it in Antwerp in 1584 in the third edition of his famous World Atlas. Uh, I even have my own prized copy right behind me that I've propped up, but I, I'm afraid you probably can't see it via Zoom. Believe me, it's terrific. The map shows these non-existent east-west mountain chains, and, the, and it lacks any sign of the familiar boot of Louisiana that protrudes south into the Gulf of Mexico, well below 30 degrees north latitude. Instead, you can see that De Soto's Rio del Espirito Santo, his, his Mississippi, descends into a large and fictitious bay that would become known as the Bay of the Holy Spirit. That imaginary bay, uh, endured, had, a, had an enormous half-life, so that a century later, LaSalle may have carried a copy of this map down the Mississippi with him. So let's turn to LaSalle. He's the earliest and the most famous of my three protagonists. I wrote a long article about him back in 1984, so I'll discuss him most briefly. LaSalle reached Canada from Rouen in 1666 at age 33, and he entered the fur trade near Montreal, but he became obsessed with the idea of finding a French passage through North America to the Pacific. He even named his outpost uh, La Petite Chine, the Little China. 
and Seneca Indians trading at his frontier post told him of a river, the, which we know as the Ohio, which had its course towards the west. And at the end of which, after seven or eight months traveling, the river fell into the sea. LaSalle took this as a reference to the Vermilion Sea or the Gulf of California. Remember that no one had devised a proper way of calculating east-west longitude accurately. Uh, that was more than a century away. And even estimating north-south latitude remained difficult in the field using crude astrolabes of the sort LaSalle carried with him. According to one contemporary, the prospect, quote, of finding by this route the passage into the Vermilion Sea induced LaSalle to venture down the Ohio, eager to attain, quote, the honor of discovering the passage to the South Sea and thereby the way to China. LaSalle's trip down the Ohio River in 1670, not shown here on the, on the right-hand map, uh, only made it to the falls, which you can see there in modern Louisville, Kentucky, before it, they turned back. His later explorations would take a more northerly approach via the Great Lakes uh, to reach the Mississippi. And by 1674, Marquette and Joliet had descended that river to the mouth of the Arkansas and returned. But beyond that point, the lower Mississippi and its end point remained a mystery to Europeans. And at that point, anything seemed possible. Some suspected that the river might twist far to the east toward Spanish Florida. Uh, or did it somehow bend way to the west, as many hoped, and empty into the Pacific? So to answer this question, LaSalle's party of some 50 Frenchmen and native partners uh, descended the river in the spring of 1682, the green line on the right. It, they reached the Gulf in April, where LaSalle famously claimed the entire Mississippi watershed for Louis XIV. And from the Gulf, LaSalle quickly retraced his route to Canada and sailed to France to report his success. He convinced the regime that starting a colony at the mouth of this river before the Spanish could get there would secure a much needed warm weather port for the French. You do that and then valuable furs from the interior can pass down the Mississippi and be shipped to Europe via the Gulf of Mexico at any time of year, avoiding the ice that sealed off Quebec every winter. So late in 1684, LaSalle left France at the head of a large and secretive colonizing expedition and reached the Gulf in early 1685. But as you can see at the bottom of this map, the ships mistakenly ended up on the Texas coast at Matagorda Bay, southwest of modern Galveston. The ill-fated colonists built a small stockade, Fort St. Louis near Matagorda Bay, while LaSalle searched desperately for his river, which he assumed must be nearby. But what had gone wrong? Anglophile historians have often argued that this Frenchman LaSalle was either incompetent or deceitful, but his mistakes can be explained another way. In his earlier descent of the Mississippi, if it went to the Gulf, he expected it to empty into DeSoto's Bay of the Holy Spirit, somewhere just above 30 degrees north latitude. You can see 30 degrees on this modern map. Uh, so you can see here that after the lower Mississippi veers toward the southeast, it actually continues several degrees farther south before it divides into small channels and empties into the Gulf. And th this huge feature is the so-called birdfoot delta. And you recognize it as the familiar toe of Louisiana's boot. But on early European maps, that landmass simply did not exist. LaSalle assumed, and this is tricky, but follow me here. He assumed that if the Mississippi had taken him that far south, 
then its mouth must lie farther west, where the coast bends to the south. And that's where he headed in 1685. A tragic mistake, not a stupid or malicious error. But we have nearly 350 years of hindsight compared to cartographers in Canada and France in the 1680s. This modern sketch reproduces an outline in outline form, a, a part of a map presented to Paris officials in 1684, two years after the trip down the river. And it's on the eve of La Salle's colonizing venture. The original actually was created in Quebec by the cartographer Jean-Baptiste Louis Franquelin, um, and it has been missing for generations. But it was traced in the late 19th century by the famous historian Fra for Francis Parkman, the Harvard historian, and his copy still exists in the Houghton Library. Based on information from La Salle's journey down the Mississippi, it shows where he would now head to plant a colony near the mouth of that river at 27 degrees latitude. And as you can see, it makes a Herculean first effort to contort the Mississippi to reach that vicinity. As you see, Franklin has left DeSoto's imagined Bay of the Holy Spirit intact at 30 degrees. And he still assumes that the Rio del Norte, the Rio Grande, flows southwest into the Pacific or the Gulf of California, rather than southeast to the Gulf of Mexico. With time, French cartographers settled on a second solution for mapping the Mississippi. Instead of reaching the Texas Gulf Coast via a huge bend uh, to the west, perhaps the entire river lay farther west than they had realized. So as you can see on the left, with longitude being so uncertain, they simply moved the river several degrees to the west by stretching the Illinois and the Ohio rivers. It would be more than a decade before Iberville finally found the actual mouth of the Mississippi as seen on the right. And only then could the French successfully colonize the Gulf Coast, uh, Biloxi in 1699, Mobile 1702, and, and New Orleans in 1718. But in 1688, the news of La Salle's assassination in East Texas by several of his own men was spreading throughout the trading posts of French Canada. The obvious question quickly became who could fill the void and continue Western exploration? With La Salle gone, who would finally win, quote, the honor of discovering the passage to the South Sea? La Salle's loyal partner, Henri de Tonti, whom you see here, considered himself the logical successor. In 1686, he had led an expedition down the Mississippi to rendezvous with La Salle's colonizers and secure the link between Canada and the Gulf. When Tonti found no sign of the plant colony, he returned upstream, disappointed. He paused at the mouth of the Arkansas River to establish a post that could watch for further developments. And he placed in charge a voyageur named Jean Couture, whom we'll meet later, who had been part of La Salle's original journey down the Mississippi. Tonti was ambitious and shrewd and well-connected, but he had lost his left hand in a war in Italy and he lacked the stamina and commitment. Instead, it's two contrasting younger explorers who stepped to the fore and both have been dismissed by historians ever since. It's not hard to see why. When you first look at the utterly confounding maps that each left behind, uh, describing the journeys they claim to have made. We'll take a closer look at each in a minute. Baron Lahontan and Jean Couture each formed bands of several dozen men, mixing French voyageurs and Native Americans, just as La Salle had done. And they both launched separate expeditions to the West in the fall of 1688. At least they say they did. La Honton at 22 was the younger of the two and his party pushed towards the Northwest. 
He later published a two volume account of his years in North America. And it appeared in both French and English editions in 1703. Hence these two versions of his map on the left. So let's deal with La Hontan first. He was born in Southwest France in 1666. His father died when he was eight, leaving him the title of Baron, but no useful inheritance. So he attended the new French Marine Academy and then sailed to Canada in 1683 at the age of 17. He spent several winters with the Algonquian Indians, learning their language and customs. He admired the egalitarianism of Canada's first peoples, and he chastised the Jesuits for trying to change their ways. So he was banned from France when he eventually returned to Europe. And when his book appeared in 1703 from radical enlightenment publishers in The Hague, the frontispiece you can see here showed a self-confident Native American armed and defiant with one foot planted on what appears to be the Bible and the other on a monarch's crown. But in 1688, La Hontan was in charge of a French outpost at the southern tip of Lake Huron. And when warfare threatened the fort, he burned it down and paddled north with his men to the stronger French outpost at uh, St. Ignace near the Straits of Mackinac. So using this modern map, we can pick up his adventure from there. He decided against spending the winter cooped up at St. Ignace or returning to Quebec as he had been ordered. Instead, he wrote to his superiors that he and his men intended to travel, quote, through the Southern countries that I have so often heard of, having engaged four or five good Ottawa huntsmen to go along. They set out in late September, and his next letter, written from St. Ignace the following May, would describe where he claimed to have been during the intervening eight months. Two solid lines show the start and the end of his trip through relatively familiar territory. From St. Ignace, the party paddled west to Green Bay, and then up the Fox River and down to Wisconsin, reaching the Mississippi on October 22nd. There, the account becomes controversial until the following March, when he describes how they floated down the Mississippi on the spring floods. They probed the lower Missouri River and the mouth of the Ohio, and then returned up the Illinois River and back up Lake Michigan to St. Ignace. But what about the crucial months in between? This Western part of Lahontan's journey was used for generations to discredit his entire career. The crucial middle portion of his account was distrusted for at least three main reasons. First of all, there is a three week gap in his tape, so to speak, from the time he reaches the Mississippi to the time he enters what he calls the Long River. Second, he used un, uses unfamiliar names for three nations along that river, and he claims they have unbelievably large towns with up to 5,000 people. And then third, when his party winters beside the northernmost group and presses them about what lies farther upriver to the west, he meets captives from that region uh, who tell him stories that most have dismissed. So let's revisit these three issues briefly, beginning with the three-week gap. Here's a photograph of the Wisconsin River uh, flowing west into the Mississippi. I, I took this picture from a bluff in Iowa looking east. That's the red dot on part of a 1718 French map by Guillaume de Lille. Lauenton says that before traveling down the Wisconsin, he had asked the chief of the Fox or Meskwaki Indians for six men, quote, to accompany me to the Long River, which I designed to trace up to its source. He goes on, instead of the six warriors that I desired, he gave me 10, La Hontan writes. 
who understood the lingua and knew the country of the Eucharos, a Western nation with whom they had traded annually for 20 years or more. Lamontan adds that his Ottawa companions were delighted by this reinforcement and were so encouraged that they told me, now we can venture safely to the plantation of the sun. And what was the shortest way to get to that region? You can see the answer on this uh, detail from Delisle's well-known map of Louisiana and the course of the Mississippi that was made a generation later. If we zoom in on a reproduction that highlights the modern state of Iowa, you can see that by 1718, a trail across northern Iowa is known clearly as Chemin de Voyageurs, the, the Voyager's Trail. 30 years earlier, this was already a well-trodden path used by Indians from the east on annual trips to trade with the Arikaras on the middle Missouri the people La Hontan called the Eucharos. So the three week gap in his account seems to involve this, his group's overland trip across Iowa. And in making this trek, La Hontan learned a significant secret that he may not have wanted to share. Near modern Sioux City, Iowa, where the Big Sioux River descends from the north, the Missouri stretches off to the northwest. For La Hontan, that juncture represented the start of the Long River, what we would call the Middle Missouri. At that same point, according to the prevalent system of borrowing watercraft, they would have had no difficulty in obtaining the indigenous dugout canoes they needed to proceed upriver. And that brings us to the second riddle. If La Hontan's Eucharos were the Arikaras, who were the people farther upriver that he called the Esanapes and the Gnixatares? He said they lived in distinctive earth lodges that looked like French ovens. As George Catlin's 19th century picture shows, that description applies to the Mandans and the Hidatsas or Minatares, uh, whose villages stretched along the Missouri in what is now North Dakota. He also said that their main towns were strikingly large. This was long taken as an imaginative lie, a clear proof of La Hontan's penchant for fabrication, but modern scholars have shown that it was in fact true. And so what about the third riddle? The stories told to him through translators by captives living with the Hadatsis. They claimed to come from lands far to the west, beyond a huge mountain range. To address this last dilemma, we have to look at the map La Hontan published to accompany his account. This is the English language version, and it's not hard to see how it could be easily dismissed. But it's not as crazy as it looks. If you accept that he has simply omitted the passage across Iowa from his map, just as he left it out of his narrative account, it could have disappeared to count, confound his rivals or through poor communication with the actual map makers. We'll probably never know. But if you divide this map into thirds, the right hand section east of the Mississippi is a rough but recognizable version of the Great Lakes region, more familiar to the French. The central section is the Long River that La Hontan explored. Uh, it shows the middle Missouri turned to flow due east uh, and depicted in a misleading way as entering directly into the upper Mississippi. At the vertical divide, there's a fleur-de-lis, uh, number one, uh, that marks the western extent of his journey. Everything to the left of that comes from the informants who drew diagrams for La Hontan, just as Sacagawea would later do for Lewis and Clark. And here's the striking part. They told him that if you continued west up the Long River, you then passed over a large mountain range, number three, 
And they lived along a river, number four, the Columbia, actually, that flowed west into a great salt sea. The men on the coast had short whiskers on their chins and uh, wore pointed hats. And the wealthy wore copper gorgets at their chests that looked like the metal that's drawn here, number five. All these are clear characteristics of Northwest Coast groups. But, but that's not all. They drew a picture of a distinctive flat roof dwelling, number six, with protruding cedar beams. You can see the beams sticking out along the uh, top. And number seven, they sketched a massive wooden war canoe that could hold scores of people. So how else could Lahontan have learned the details he recounted? And why have scholars failed to connect the dots that have been in front of them through these distinctive map illustrations for more than 300 years? So my last and most obscure explorer is the French voyageur Jean Couture. He claimed to have traveled uh, counterclockwise in a huge circle from the Mississippi to the Gulf of California and back between 1688 and 1690. He was at the Arkansas post when LaSalle's murderers arrived there in 1687. So he was one of the first to know. Uh, like La Honton, he had reasons to press forward with LaSalle's agenda of westward exploration. Unlike La Honton, his focus was the Southwest. In the, in the 1690s, he would defect to the English in Carolina, and which many French voyageurs did actually, and he offered them without success uh, the opportunity for him to lead them to the places he had seen. Uh, like La Honton, he's often been dismissed as an untrustworthy boaster and deceiver, um, but I'm not so sure. Because of two big changes in the previous decade. First, as shown by this 1687 map, the French had learned from a high-ranking Spanish defector named Diego Peñalosa that the Rio Grande did not flow to the Pacific, but to the Gulf of Mexico, offering access to French intruders. And second, the massive and successful Pueblo revolt in New Mexico in 1680 had galvanized Native American resistance to Spanish domination. From now on, Southwestern Indians might view Spain's European rivals as potential allies. This larger Coronelli map uh, summarized where French awareness of the American West stood in 1688. It depicted the Mississippi pushed mistakenly to the West, and it now showed the Rio Grande correctly flowing east to the Gulf of Mexico. La uh, claim, his claims regarding the, the long river to the Northwest uh, would not appear in print for another 15 years. And everything farther south and west was drawn secondhand from scarce Spanish accounts. So here's where Couture steps in. And, and what a remarkable uh, figure. So more than, more than a century ago, when researching the colonial southeast, the historian named Werner Crane wrote an article about Couture's quote, singular career, both in New France and in Carolina. Though he didn't know of the map I'm going to show you. But Crane noted that rather more is known of Couture's experiences in exploration and trade than of the activities of most of his class, meaning voyageurs. Still, unlike La Salle and La Hontan, he never returned to Europe to recount his experiences. And unlike the other two, this hardened courier de bois had a limited formal education. So inevitably, he left few written traces. 
Couture never had direct access to the French court in Paris or the Catholic hierarchy in Rome. Instead, he appears briefly in English colonial documents, and then he disappears into oblivion in the Midwest sometime after 1700. And yet records from South Carolina in the late 1690s show that his acquaintances called this voyageur, quote, the greatest trader and traveler amongst the Indians for more than 20 years. And one confusing chart suggests the reason why. This, this small map, annotated in French, is in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. Uh, it was first noticed by a map librarian in the 1880s and given a date of 1689. And then during the chaotic 20th century, archivists misplaced it for several generations. But it has recently resurfaced during a modernization and digitization program. So now there's a clear and zoomable copy up on the BN's impressive uh, website if you want to go explore it further. And I argue that if re-examined and accepted, it suggests a remarkable achievement. It clearly resembles the 1688 Coronelli map, which you see outlined here at the upper right. And below it is an outlined version of this very similar couture related map. You can see that the Rio Grande has become more elaborate. The extensive Arkansas River has been added. And above that, the uh, west to east waterway, uh, right there, if you can see it, um, made by the uh, Osage river flowing into the lower Missouri and east to the Mississippi is labeled simply as the Osage River. But here's the thing, over this flawed contemporary version of the western region, someone has labored to depict a long and specific journey, squeezing distances and directions where necessary to conform to the familiar but distorted map outline uh, as understood by cartographers in France. The purported odyssey begins at the upper right on the elongated Illinois River, where La Salle had built his first Fort St. Louis at Starved Rock after descending the Mississippi. And a note explains that from here, Jean Couture set out on the 14th of October, 1688, with 30 men. When we zoom in, you can see that a dotted line just west of the Mississippi uh, descends south to the Gulf, indicating the vague claim of French Louisiana. And similar lines mark the Spanish territories of New Mexico towards the top and New Biscay towards the bottom on the south. It's the lands in between, all the way to the Gulf of California, that interested Couture. His party descended the Illinois to the Mississippi and paused near what is now East St. Louis. And a label placed there, uh, you can barely see it in the upper right, I think, states simply in French that his voyage begins here. And from there, a trail of dashes tracks a circuitous counterclockwise journey down the Mississippi, up the Rio Grande, through the Sierra Mountains, and down the St. Francis River to the Gulf of California or the Vermilion Sea. After pausing to construct canoes, the party claim, claims to have explored both shores of the Gulf of California. Eventually, they returned by a more northern route through the Arkansas River Valley, familiar to Couture, and then east down the lower Missouri. At intervals, small crosses appear. You can see those accompanied by numbers. And according to a note at the edge of the map, these crosses represent places where the party paused, and the number indicates how many days they remained. In, in some places, a, a cause for delay is noted, such as a tempest, a downpour, or simply bad weather. Um, at one point on the Mississippi, just below the 
Ubache or Ohio River. They paused 13 days, quote, to construct some new canoes. So are such annotations convincing details or part of an elaborate fabrication? Could Couture have traveled across the Southwest, moving through the lands of one Native American group after another, just as Cabeza de Vaca had done 150 years before? If we replace all the French annotations with numbers, one to 20 from east to west, right to left, we get an overview, which is a little easier to decipher and discuss. On the right is the emerging French cartography of the Lower Mississippi as it appeared immediately after word of La Salle's failed colony in East Texas reached Paris. And at the center is the Rio Grande as drawn for the French by the defector Peñalosa. And on the left, beyond a river called the St. Francis, appears the Sea of California or the Sea of Cortez, as claimed by the Spanish. You can see Baja California is still labeled as an island. Now, time is moving along, and I, I want to have time for discussion. But very briefly, let's look more closely at each half of the map and the related annotations moving from east to west, just as Couture claimed to have traveled. So starting on the right, number one marks the so-called Lake of the Illinois, or Lake Michigan. Number two is Fort St. Louis at Starved Rock. Number three is the official start near Cahokia. Uh, number four is the pause below the Ohio, uh, perhaps to replace bark canoes with sturdier dugouts. And then moving south near number five, they report, quote, an abundance of deer, elk, and wild oxen, meaning bison. Then reaching the Gulf, number six, they probe east and west for any sign of LaSalle's deserted colony, not knowing that it had already been abandoned. And then they note seven on the Arkansas River indicates that somewhere farther south, is the country where, quote, Monsieur LaSalle was killed. In the West, number eight records Santa Fe and the 22 towns or pueblos around it. Uh, farther south at number nine, near modern El Paso, the map notes correctly the three settlements where the Spanish retreated in the wake of the Pueblo Revolt. And number 10 reports that New Biscay is, quote, occupied by very few Spaniards who guard numerous mines. Note 11, farther west, states correctly that above the city of Culiacan, the Spanish, quote, have very few men here. And then farther north, the next annotations describe a region still beyond Spanish reach. Number 12 observes accurately that, quote, the Spanish could not conquer it for lack of men and remain in constant war with the Indians, their irreconcilable enemies. According to note 13, uh, these countries contain a great number of cattle and wild horses. Number 14 says all this vast region is inhabited only by Indians. And number 15 marks a spot where they paused for 10 days to make canoes. Note 16 explains that this country is occupied by Indians, get this, who show a great love for the French. And then 17 and 18 record pauses for bad weather while exploring the Gulf. Number 19 reports after visiting the Baja coast that the island of California is inhabited, quote, by Indians who worship the sun and are of a good nature. The last note, number 20, stretches all along the coast of Baja California in what has also become known as the Sea of Cortez. You can see it here, uh, and it uh, deserves a separate slide. Because the last note from Couture's purported expedition reads, quote, 
one finds pearls here, but they are somewhat brownish. And in fact, when you read up on the world's finest pearl fisheries, you find that the Sea of Cortez is near the top of the list. Pearls from the Gulf of California are indeed both plentiful and dark. Coastal groups like the Yaqui uh, had been harvesting the oysters for centuries and roasting them for food, putting little value on the pearls themselves. But for the Europeans, it was a different story and the Spanish began to hunt for them. Uh, but there seems almost no way that a 17th century French voyageur would have known secondhand of their existence, much less their brownish color. So like the distinctive Pacific War Canoe on La Hontan's map, this small detail is a telling argument, at least for me, in favor of the idea that Couture also may have made the journey that he claimed. Unable to get a hearing from the French, Couture defected to South Carolina in the 1690s, as I've said, but the English still clung to the Atlantic coast. So when he talked of riches in the West, people in Charleston assumed that he was referring to Appalachia. My own sense is that for all their shortcomings, La Salle and La Hontan and Couture were not clever charlatans or travel liars as they have usually been described. They were tackling nearly impossible tasks, but they may well have done all or most of what they claimed. To me, it's the bureaucrats in Quebec and Paris who bear the blame for the fact that little came of their remote explorations. And the largest joke is on the armchair scholars who dismissed these exploits out of hand. They, they proved unable to comprehend the obstacles involved and unwilling to give the benefit of the doubt for feats that we find unimaginable. It's what the great historian E.P. Thompson called the enormous condescension of posterity. So I'll end by saying that on balance, I think we remain slow at unlocking all the surprises of the early exploration of the Trans-Mississippi West by Europeans. And perhaps especially those mysteries that are still hidden in old maps. So let me end there and let's hear some feedback and discussion. Thank you so much, Peter, for that great presentation. Um, we got, uh, if you have any questions, go to the chat first, uh, and then we'll pick them up from there. Uh, Sharon um, asked, who named the Canadian River and when? Well, there are other experts on here who know the answer to that. It, it comes later, I think, but I'm, but I'm not exactly sure. That, that is a good question. I, the implication is, I guess, that maybe these French Canadians uh, brought it with them. And I, I, it's, it's easy to find. I would Google the Canadian River. I, I think it's been discussed, but I don't remember the specific answer. Okay. Uh, you got some compliments saying amazing talk. <laughs> then from uh, Dave, why was La Salle done in? Well, you think about it. They get to Matagorda Bay in... Um, 1685, he's got more than 100 people, families. I mean, it's a real, they're going to set up a colony. And he has promised them that, that they're right close to the mouth of the Mississippi River. This is just hang in there, folks. This is going to be great. We're going to find this river. We'll team up with Tonti and the people up north, and things will really begin to move. And so for two whole years, he sends expeditions out in every direction. He sends a, a group uh, south along the coast. They go up the mouth of the Rio Grande. Uh, and we, and the, the Indians there are suspicious that these people, they certainly look like Spaniards. And, and we have, there's a wonderful oral re, uh, report that gets passed down, which says we thought they were Spaniards, but then they took, they gave us their shirts and they danced with us. 
So these are voyageurs, you know, these are not conquistadors. They, they really know how to relate to local Indian groups. Uh, they live in a very similar manner. Uh, they have Native Americans traveling with them, so on. Anyway, it takes, so for two whole years, he's probing further and further into uh, East Texas, trying to find the mouth of the Mississippi. And finally, he decides, you know, it must be further east. I will head to the northeast, and eventually I'm going to hit it somehow. And two of the men that he takes with him are, you know, have been discontented from the start, um, and, and they finally assassinate him. I mean, they decide that they're better off on their own. Uh, so there was a lot of ill feeling towards him for having led them to the wrong place. Sad story. <laughs> so uh, from West Brown, what was Couture St. Francis River? Was it Colorado or the Gila? Well, we don't know. I mean, it's further uh, south than the Colorado. It, um, it's probably the Yaki River, but there are three or four streams that flow down into the central part of the Gulf of California. They were all frequently traveled. They're actually, they flow more north-south than they do on his map. But it's the same route that, you know, when Coronado years before had gone north up the coast, that's the route that he took. It was, uh, it, so this was uh, familiar, uh, it was passable territory. Let's let's put it that way. And I made reference to Cabeza de Vaca. I'm sure many of you know his wonderful narrative uh, from the 1530s. You know, it's exactly the it, the same kind of route that that he took. Okay. Um, it's uh, maybe this is similar to this from the Rio Grande. Did Couture follow an overland route to the Gulf of California, or did he follow a river? And it's so which river? Well, one of the things that I didn't discuss on that map, but somebody with very sharp eyes might have seen it, is that at the when the Rio Grande is coming down from the north and then it turns to go to the Gulf, and right near that turn, there's a little A marked on the map. And there's no description on the map as to what that A was. My sense is that someone said, it's right around here that we left the Rio Grande and headed west. There, but it's it's the, the the space has been squeezed together on the map. It would have been a longer expedition, but again, following tradi a traditional route, uh, they would have gone across the Sierra Mountains and then picked up one of these uh, south flowing rivers into the Gulf. And there were native towns all along those uh, rivers. And these are the people who felt, I mean, even if you go back 150 years and read Cabezo de Vaca, he's coming from, uh, from Texas. And when he gets there, he's absolutely shocked that the Spanish are enslaving all these people. He runs into a slaving expedition. So th these people had been exploited and enslaved and word was out that uh, the Spanish were, you needed to stay away from them or resist them. And that's even as uh, Catholic missionaries and Jesuits were, were moving into the area very slowly. But the Indian perception in the 1680s after the Pueblo Revolt was that we're, we'll take any allies we can get. And if these people dislike the Spanish, we'll be, we'll be friendly to them and, and show them what we want. Hence the little annotation on the map saying these people are incredibly friendly to the French. Um, John Doctor says, uh, you mentioned that the Soto has Mississippi emptying into an imaginary bay. Could Lake Pontchartrain be mistaken as a bay into which the river entered? Uh, it could be related to Lake Pontchartrain. No, but none of them had seen Lake Pontchartrain. You know, the, I think the people who understood the Gulf Coast were the Native Americans who had traveled along it uh, for centuries, and a few Spanish buccaneers and rogues, you know, who had gone. They were the the voyageurs of the sea. I mean, there were these. Uh, 
pirates virtually, you know, who knew that area well, but the hierarchy, the governor in Cuba or the, or people in, uh, in other colonies didn't, they weren't as good as the voyageurs at, at getting correct information from the native peoples. Um, and often, as we know, they, I mean, Indians very often gave false information to try to get people out of their territory. Um, I, I think it's more likely a, a, a misshapen version of, uh, of Mobile, or, but, it, but some, it comes from DeSoto. So yeah. someone told DeSoto and his men that, that that's the way it worked, you know, and uh, so it, but, but it, it totally confused the next few generations of, of explorers because, you know, the, the challenge always, and it still applies to us today, going on a Sunday hike in the mountains is how much to trust your own instincts and what you see in front of you and how much to trust the map that you got from the filling station or even that's on your GPS, you know, uh, and, you know, we've all been given wrong turns by, uh, you know, and that, so that's a, a constant uh, struggle. Mm -hmm. Did all three explorations have similar motivations, you think? Uh, in a certain sense, they all wanted to get to the South Sea and to get credit for it. You know, honor was a big deal in 17th century France and uh, you, you know, both, um, you know, politically, economically, every other way, you could, you would be a, a hero if, if you were the one who, who doped out the, the secret. Um, so in that sense, they were all motivated the same way. Uh, there's an element of, of simply of geographical interest in, in Carter, in, uh, in, but, th but there's all kinds of different interests involved. You know, there's these cartographers back in Europe who are pressing them for information. There are Native Americans who are handing them maps, drawing them maps, but, and some of you know this, that Native American cartography was very different. It looked more like a New York subway map, you know, it was, it sort of showed the relationship of different groups, it, but it, it didn't, it wasn't operating on latitude and longitude. It was, it was showing relationships and hunting areas and things like that. So putting these different kinds of knowledge together is what's going on in this period. And what, what fascinates me about it the most is that I think this generation in the late 17th century, is the one moment, I, I don't hesitate to call it a golden age, but there's an, there's an equilibrium between native knowledge and European knowledge where they both res, they respect each other and they're, they're each learning from each other. It's not the sort of hierarchical relationship that you'll talk about in a few weeks with, with Lewis and Clark. I mean, by the time they go up the Missouri, They've got guns with them, and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're we po always portray them as nice guys, but they're pretty dictatorial about where they're going, and nobody should mess with them, and, and uh, here's what we need, and here's what we want. These folks uh, understand completely that they're dependent on the Native Americans. When LaSalle goes back to France to explain what he's done, one of the things that um, after going down the river and people are unsure that that he's telling the truth and he says well look i can speak 10 10 languages and that they immediately just laugh and say well that shows that you know i mean that's crazy and what he means is i can talk to this person who can talk to this person who can talk to this person you know it, you drop me down somewhere in the mississippi valley with three or four Native Americans, and we'll we'll figure it out. You know, we'll there will be some sign language, there will be some shared language, there, um, and uh, and that was true for for all of them that they they were they understood that they were tapping into a system where Native Americans had been speaking different languages to each other for generations. So when the 
when the Fox Indian chief uh, in Wisconsin says, yeah, I can give you 10 guys who they know how to get there and they can speak the language. And when you read La Hontan, he says, we're going up the river, we get to this first village, it's the first Arikara village. And the, all these people come out on the bluff with with their spears and bows and arrows, just in case this is an enemy, you know, who's this coming? And then they hear these uh, uh, Meskwaki Indians speaking their language. And they say, no, it's us, we're coming back, you know, and, and immediately they're ushered into town and, and wined and dined. You know? um, so, and, and we tend to forget that. And that's why I showed that interesting um, National Park Service map that I grew up on that kind of thing, you know, where Native Americans just are, don't even show up on the map. You know, it's, it's an empty continent, you know, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's quite the reverse, you know. In fact, up until 1700, the, the Indian groups are much more numerous than the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the invaders. Though when La Salle comes down the river, he's carrying DeSoto's description with him, and he's not sure he's on the same river because the population village by village is so much lower. I mean, he's because there's DeSoto brings disease with him. There's been decimation already by the late 17th century in the lower Mississippi Valley. And he's struck you know, that that these these villages are not as large as the ones DeSoto encountered. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of more questions from Brian. Did Delil use these journeys in his map making? Say it again, Angel. Did Delil use these journeys in the, in his map making? Well, I, I mean, some of you know this world better than I do, but my, my sense is that these these uh, French cartographers and, and in other European countries too, they were they were competing with each other, they were sharing with each other, they were picking up any scrap of information. So just the way I said, you have to be careful when you use your hiking map in the Rockies as to whether it's giving you the right thing. If you're back in Paris and someone is handing you a map and saying, here's where so-and-so says he went, you're trying to figure out how much to bend the map that you made five years ago. You know, is this, I mean, it's when, so a good, and a good example is this case of the Rio Grande that you started with on hell, you know, that, the, all their maps, uh, that Briggs map that I showed at the beginning, all, all show this uh, river flowing to the southwest. And Peñalosa had been the governor of New Mexico. So he'd lived on the Rio Grande. And he knew exactly where it went. And he's thrown out for corruption. I mean, he's, he's replaced and he's basically thrown out of the empire. So he's an angry... Uh, uh, diplomat, and he defects. He goes to the French and says, look, you know, I, I, I know something that you really want to know. You know, I can tell you where that river really goes. You know, it's what you guys have been calling the Rio Bravo. That actually goes all the way up to uh, Santa Fe. And, um, and that's a, you know, it's, it's the way we would steal some kind of nuclear secrets in the, in the, 21st century or something. These are carefully guarded. And that's why I think it's plausible that, that La Hontan could simply not tell anybody about this trail across Iowa. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell them later, you know, or they, and within 30 years, there it is on Delisle's map, you know, but, but 30 years before that, it's a race to find the, you know, grasp the, the brass ring and, and, and they're playing their cards very, very close. Okay. And talking about La Hontan, has, has his journal been translated? Oh, absolutely. It, um, several times, um, the, uh, the original first version now, when I discovered this, it cost $7,000. And I thought, wow, there's only six of these copies out there. I should buy all of them. And suddenly this guy's going to become famous. I looked yesterday, it's worth $11,000 now. You know, that's the, the first edition from 1703. But in um, around 1900, uh, famous um, 
scholar uh, and translator uh, uh, named Ruben Thwaites, uh, who was responsible for translating a lot of the Jesuit relations. And he did an annotated translation of La Hontan, um, you, but you, comparing the French and English versions. Um, and that's more readily available. And then there've been several Canadian editions as well. And it's interesting because the Canadians um, who would obviously be very interested in these guys, but they're, they don't know, they don't have a very good feel for US geography. So they want La Hontan to be going towards Hudson Bay. You know, so they say, oh, well, you know, he's the salt sea. I bet he's probably trying to get the Hudson Bay. And they create this elaborate scheme where he's going uh, north. Um, I, I think that's not right. Okay. Final question. The place to see in Lake in what is now Northwest Nevada is named after Baron La Hontan. Yes. Any idea, any idea why and by whom he was commemorated that far west? Well, I, th that's a good question. And I, I, I haven't revisited it for years. I can't remember. I was surprised as anybody else to find out there was a, a, a town and a lake and even a fish. There's even a La Hontan trout or something like that. Um, and I think it's just taking names off, off of maps and saying, this is cool. I, d I don't know who puts it there first. There's a whole school. I, I just, poked fun at the Canadians for wanting to go to Hudson Bay. For most Americans, often they would say, oh, Great Salt Sea, I bet that's the Great Salt Lake. You know, I bet, I bet they're talking about the Great Salt Lake. Um, they weren't, but, but there have been various articles to that effect. And you have to remember that in all these cases, we're dealing with very few documents, very fragmentary evidence. And so you really have to keep an keep an open mind. I'm, I'm ready to be disproven at any point if, if uh, other evidence emerges. But the more I've dug into couture, the more convinced I am. I mean, there's, there's new documents emerging in South Carolina. Um, and uh, we're starting to get a fuller picture. We can go on and on and on, Peter, but uh... Uh, I think we should stop right now. Okay, there's one more question. I'm going to let it go. Beth Simmons, I'm working on the history of the Fort Presque Isle and the village established there. Have you seen any evidence of it in your research? Um, I, no, I'm not sure I even got the whole question, but I, I, I think not. I, 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 no. Fort Presque, okay. Yeah, there's a lot of mysteries, but to thank you for yes. the fascinating talk, Peter. We really appreciate it. I think uh, uh, you gave us a good idea of all these uh, uh, mysteries that those explorers faced. Uh, in a way, I'm grateful that they didn't have any GPS or remote sensing or Zoom or not even an idea of, of longitude, because that gives us an opportunity to gather and, and, and uncover all these riddles and, and mysteries. So really appreciate it. Oh, good. You I've for, enjoyed for it. For joining us. Uh, Keep an eye on our website. Uh, Naomi, you want to say anything at the end? Or? No? Okay. Keep an eye on the website. There's uh, many things coming, um, and uh, not only from us, but also from other map societies. You're getting some applause there, Peter, so that's good. That's good. Thank you. Look at that. Thanks. Okay. Thanks to all of you. You're going to take Appreciate it. it. You can take it home. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. It's great seeing you. We'll see you ne next, uh, in the next event of the Rocky Mountain Map Society. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye.